That's good. Wow. There's a lot of people in the room. I'm really excited to uh, see everyone. Appreciate the support for Amy. Appreciate the support for Progressive Movement in Tennessee. We've got a lot of things we want to work on. And uh, Amy, I think, is uh, the best candidate on the ticket to get us where we need to be here in Tennessee and in the South for that matter. Uh, so I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, I got a call yesterday uh, to do this and they asked me to give a few remarks. So uh, I'm gonna try to warm me up a little bit before Amy gets up here. <laughs> I don't play free bird, man. That's not on my repertoire. That said, uh, I have never thought I would ever be a politician or trying to be a politician, but uh, over in Blunt County, there's a big red wall and we're trying to tear it down. And it's going to take some time, uh, but we're trying to make it happen in November. We ran in 2018. Uh, we were the first Democrat to run for that seat in a long time. Uh, we knocked about 9,000 doors, which you wouldn't believe how surprised some of those folks would be when they answered. <laughs> they haven't had that happen over there. And uh, we plan on working as hard as we can uh, to make November happen. Great job, James. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> so uh, we obviously didn't win in 2018, but we didn't lose either because we didn't quit. And uh, we're as emboldened as ever to, to do something about this. I'm a lifelong Tennessean. I'm very familiar with the political climate of our state. Um, it's very difficult sometimes. Uh, but I have friends and neighbors that don't necessarily think like me, but we also have to figure out a way to find some common ground and unite and come together to get things done. And Amy's certainly proven that. So uh, if you're in your community, my mom and dad raised me that if you don't agree with something or you see someone tr being treated unfairly, don't just sit back and accept it as a status quo, get up there and change it. So I think that's why everybody in this room is here, and I can assure you that's why I'm here, and that's also why Amy Klobuchar is here today. So I want to tell you a couple things about Amy and I that we actually have in common. Uh, some of it is obviously politically and policy based. Some of it is just our life experiences. We're both grandkids of minors. Yep. Her, uh, her uh, grandfather was a uh, iron ore miner in northern Minnesota. My entire family, except my dad and I, uh, didn't end up in the mines, but my papa and the rest of them were in the western Kentucky coal fields. So we very much understand the value of unions and organized labor and how they protect working families. Amy and I were also raised by public school teachers. That's right. So we both know and have witnessed our moms use their own hard-earned money to go buy school supplies because the state is not funding our school system properly. And we are both certainly champions of public education, our public school system, and we know that our moms felt that way as well, but the most important thing to them was a passion to teach our kids and to teach them right. And that includes teaching them about science and climate change. Our public school system here in Tennessee is absolutely under a full frontal attack right now by Governor Lee and our supermajority Republican House and Senate. And I can promise you, any of you teachers out there, you have no bigger ally at the state capitol than I am if you get elected. And you got my ear constantly, and I will help with your son, Mike Stewart, to pass common sense, reasonable bills to protect our public education system and get rid of that crazy voucher. Amy and I believe that access to quality health care is a human right. We both, we both feel that way because we've both been, for lack of a better term, screwed over by the system. I've been a, a chronic patient with a chronic issue for uh, my entire life, at least since I was 12 years old, and the patients are always the ones that get the short end of the stick. And Amy truly believes that we can find some common ground 
build up on Obamacare and make sure that we can provide high quality access to health care for all Tennesseans and everyone in this country. And specifically here in Tennessee, that means we have got to quit letting our legislators in Nashville stick their middle finger up to D.C. and we have got to expand Medicaid. And we need to do that now. There are hundreds of thousands of working Tennesseans, working Tennesseans, that do not have access to quality care simply because of our Republican supermajority in Nashville. And if y'all will help me and the other Democratic candidates on the ticket, we'll work as hard as we can to change that with the people that are already up there. Amy and I are both principal progressives that are running to unite and not divide. Unfortunately, our uh, current administration doesn't know how to do that. Amy's record speaks for itself. She's reached across the aisle many times to find that common ground and to get things done as opposed to just simply having a constant roadblock in D.C. That's why I pulled the lever for her last week when I went and early voted. I'm a biology professor at Maryville College, a little small liberal arts school in Blount County. That's right, go Scots. Amy and I both believe in climate change and we believe in science. We both agree that we have to be more proactive to combat climate, climate change and we must absolutely act now. And that includes making sure we are training our future teachers to teach science to our kids so that we don't fall behind other countries across the world when it comes to STEM education and workforce training. And finally, I'll say this, and I know from the bottom of my heart that I feel this way, and based on Amy's record and what she's done in D.C. and how she's run her campaign and how she's backed up what she has said, she will look you in the eye and she will tell you what she's going to do, and she'll do it. And we need that more now than ever. So without any further ado, it is my distinct honor a pleasure to introduce who I hope will be the next president of the United States, Amy Klobuchar. to be here. I, okay, this is maybe the biggest rally at 9 a.m. Okay, that is, who has a rally at 8.30 a.m.? But you guys were here, and it means so much. I think you know with Super Tuesday, um, 14 states, uh, that's a lot. Uh, so we've just come from South Carolina, where I was um, for most of the week, and then we moved over uh, to North Carolina, uh, where I had a town hall and then an incredible visit uh, to the Woolworths lunch counter. I had never seen that. Uh, it was the Greensboro, uh, the sit-in. It was just this incredible experience because they preserved that. And then we were back in uh, Virginia, in Northern Virginia, had a huge event, and then Nashville last night and Knoxville today. So. I first of all wanted to thank Jay. What an exuberant introduction. That was so good. 
unbelievable. Don't you think he would be a great member of the state house? Um, then also, I wanted to thank uh, LaKenya for her leadership of uh, this county unit here. I was once a Democratic county chair, so I know it's not that easy. Uh, thank you for your work. Um, and then also, Knoxville City Council member Lauren Ryder is somewhere around here. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And then I also wanted to mention the vice chair of the next uh, county Democratic Party, Matt Shears, and his wife, Lauren, are also here. Um, we have Kelly May, the Knox County Democratic Party Secretary. Um, we have a candidate for Congress, Renee Hoyos. Right over here. We're pretty excited because we're going to have this blue wave go across the whole state. In fact, we are going to be uh, building a blue wall around all these states, including Tennessee, a, a beautiful blue wall, and we're going to make Donald Trump pay for it. Um, also here is Sarah Heron, the chair of the Blunt County Democratic Party. Uh, Nathan Higdon, who's the vice chair of the Blunt County Democratic Party. And then Claiborne County Commissioner Sean Peters. Uh, somewhere. All right. Now, has anyone not been introduced? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Um, we are on a journey that got me here uh, early in the morning in Knoxville. And it actually started, as you know, in the middle of a blizzard um, in the middle of the Mississippi River with four inches of snow on my head. And I picked that place uh, to announce on that island because I want to make the point it is time to cross the river of our divides to a higher plane in our politics. And to me, that means standing up for people, having people's back. It's one of the reasons I actually also picked that place is because it is a mile and a half away from where that 35W bridge collapsed in the middle of a beautiful summer day. And you know a lot about infrastructure in this part of the state and what happens if you don't invest. Um, in this case, this bridge it really was an eight-lane highway. And what I saw there was this momentary, extraordinary courage of so many ordinary people, which is what you see every single day in this country. An off-duty firefighter that happened to be walking by she saw these cars, it was, there were 55 cars and trucks submerged in the water. She tethered herself to the side, dove in and out looking for survivors. The tasty truck driver, the guy came upon a school bus, it's a bridge is splitting, he had one second to decide. He knew he could ram into that school bus, he probably would have saved his life, but he veered off into what was almost a certain death and burned to death in his cab, but saved the school bus. The school bus plummeted 30 feet down. It was hanging on a guardrail. There was one camp counselor, young guy, named Hernandez. He's standing in the back. He has a second when the doors open up. Does he run off that bus? No. He gets all 30 kids off that bus to safety. That, that is America. And what unites all of this is, first of all, that there are people out there that have so much more courage in the face of adversity than Donald Trump. Secondly, secondly, what unites us, whether we are fired up Democrats or independents or people um, who want to see a change, some moderate Republicans that can't stand what's going on, what unites us is that we know that the heart of America is bigger than the heart of the guy in the White House. We know that. And we also know, when it comes to this presidential race, that we want to have a candidate that doesn't shut people out. We want to have someone that brings people with her. Um, and someone that just doesn't want to eat by a victory. No, someone who wants to win big. Because the only way 
the only way to get done all of this stuff you're hearing about in the debates and everything uh, that you know you need in Tennessee, like that expansion of Medicaid, which didn't go as broad as it should have, which means uh, more investment in education and infrastructure, which means finally doing something about the cost of health care and prescription drugs. You know that to do this, we not only have to win the presidency, we also have to win the U.S. U.S. Senate and send Mitch McConnell packing. Kind of a, a neighbor, I guess, right? Like you guys get firsthand. <laughs> you guys get firsthand. Okay, I won't. I'm not claiming him. I'm not. He's not in. Your, he's not in your state. Okay, yeah. Let's make that very, very clear. Very, very clear. So what we know is that to get things done, these 400 bills that are sitting on his desk, including democracy reform, which would make a huge difference, one of my bills, uh, to automatically register every kid in this country to vote when they turn 18 to reverse the corrosive effects of Citizens United by passing a constitutional amendment to allow that to happen. To get rid of something that has plagued the South to stop the horrible practice of purging people from the voting roll. Because if we had these reforms in place and it made it easier for every person to vote in one of your southern states, Georgia, I can tell you right now, Stacey Abrams would have been governor right now. But I think we also know that something's happening in the South. Something big. Why do we know that? Well, we'll start in Louisiana, where we just re-elected a Democratic governor. Then. You go to Kentucky, where Mitch McConnell now has a Democratic governor. That happened. You look at Virginia, kind of on the edge, where they just flipped the state house and flipped the state senate. So what is happening right now is that we are running candidates that people like in their state. They fit their state. They may not be celebrities. <laughs> They may not have the biggest bank account, but people trust them and they know they're gonna get things done and they know that they're gonna make change. So no, I don't wanna shut those voters out. Uh, to me, it is uh, this simple notion that not everyone that watches the debates right now, and by the way, a bunch of people are tuning in that stayed home in 2016. A bunch of people are tuning in that maybe voted for some other candidate or voted for Donald Trump, but they're looking for an alternative. And to a bunch of these people, including some people in this room, they may not agree with everything that's said on the debate stage. I don't agree with everything that's said on the debate stage. Um, but what they do agree on is this. We need a decency check on this president. We need to bring, we need to bring decency, decency back to the White House. Because I remember the days when my parents would turn on the TV when the president was speaking, even if it was someone we didn't vote for. And they would do that because they felt it was a civic duty to watch the president, to understand what that president was saying, to understand the issues of the day. Now, if your kids walk in the room or your grandkids walk in the room and this president is speaking, you've got to literally mute the volume because no one knows what he's going to say next and there are things that you don't want your kids to hear. It's also a patriotism check. You think of this state, so many people who have volunteered to serve over the years. Well, think of this president standing next to Vladimir Putin at an international conference. A reporter asks what about Russian interference in our election. He turns to a ruthless dictator and Putin and makes a joke about it. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have lost their lives on the battlefield standing up for our democracy. Thousands of people from this state. That's what World War II was about. It was standing up for democracies across the world. Four little girls in Alabama 
where I'm going to be tomorrow. Four little girls lost their lives in that church at the height of the civil rights movement. They were innocent. They just wanted to be part of that democracy, and other people are trying to shove them away from that democracy. Our country's best moments and our worst moments have been about democracy and our freedoms and our civil rights. And this president, when asked about a foreign country, which is exactly what our founding fathers feared uh, when they established our nation, they wanted to be rid of foreign influence. This guy, when asked about a foreign country invading our election, he turns to that ruthless dictator and he makes a joke about it. For all of our veterans out here, we all know that it's not a joke at all. It is our country. And I can tell you right now, the rule of law cannot handle four more years of a president who thinks he's above it. We cannot. Our, our democracy cannot handle four more years of a president who thinks he can bulldoze through it. And the American dream can't handle four more years of a president who thinks he can pick pick who lives it. That is what we're talking about here. And so when I mention these people that we want to bring with us so we can win in that congressional race in Kentucky, in Tennessee, what I mean, well, I just keep thinking of Mitch McConnell next door. And back. What I mean, what I mean when I talk about that is the voter in Minnesota who was a cattle rancher and he took me on a tour of his ranch and we were on this ATV and we were dodging all these huge cows and I thought this is not how I want to die. <laughs> and he brought me into his house and everyone left and he said, you know, we voted for Trump. And I said, what do you mean? You mean your family, the ranchers? He said, no, I mean, I did. I just don't like to talk about myself. He said, I mean, we is me. And he said, because we were mad about health care. So that's why we voted that way. And he said, then I saw him standing in front of the wall. And I go, no, no, the wall hasn't been built. And he says, no, 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 the day after the inauguration, it was the CIA wall. And this guy remembers that our president gave an incredibly partisan speech about the size of his inauguration crowd in front of this sacred wall that is covered in the stars of anonymous agents who died in the line of duty for our country. Each star is for a different deceased agent. Every family knows which star is theirs. But our president gave a partisan speech in front of that wall. And for this guy, he said, that was wrong. I started to think what I did was wrong. Then he said the Boy Scout jamboree. And he remembered, because he was a Boy Scout, that the president gave this very partisan speech to a group of young people. And by the way, I told him my husband had been a Boy Scout. My husband is one of six boys. And his parents had uh, four boys. And they wanted a girl. She got pregnant again. And they had identical twin boys. <laughs> and they lived in a trailer home until my husband was in sixth grade with triple bunk beds. And uh, five of the six boys actually became Eagle Scouts. And I don't like to say, I don't like to say which one didn't make it because I don't want to embarrass my husband. He's, he's not here. I don't know where he is. He's uh, somewhere in Virginia campaigning. So that's, this guy told me, he said, that was it for me, that moment, that speech. That's when I decided, he said, for me, what I did was not patriotic. Or the guy in northern New Hampshire in a town called Conway who's a long line of voters and they all have these happy stickers on. I'm a climate change voter, I'm a Supreme Court voter, I'm a reproductive rights voter. And then there's a guy in a brown jacket. I said, sir, you don't have a sticker on. And he says, ah, that's because I was a Trump voter and we don't have stickers here. And he said, but these are my neighbors and they don't know and so don't say anything about it. And he goes, but I am not doing it again. So that's what I'm talking about. So 
If we're going to win and win big, we have to get this and bring people with us. Um, and to do that, I think, first of all, we've got to give an alternative. Now, those debates, I'm sure, have driven some of you a little, like you're like, seriously. You know, the back and forth, the back and forth. And that's why I have tried my best. I know it does not create viral moments every time. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't create viral moments because I think, one, you've got to give the people watching an alternative to Donald Trump. You have to point out how you're different than him, what you you will do differently, and that you also have to have an optimistic economic agenda for the people of this country. So um, those on the debate stage this time, I did have a photo that went viral of me standing in between uh, two of the participants, the Vice President and Tom Steyer, who were having a really vigorous fight about something, and then you see me smiling <laughs> in the middle. They're like this holding on to my podium. And the funny backstory on that is that, um, well, the uh, president had gone after Mayor Bloomberg uh, for being too short, and the president claimed he was five foot four. So let me tell you this right now. I am the only one on the stage that can claim to be five foot four. <laughs> So I have this little box I stand on so that people can see me at the debates. It's not that high, but it helps. So I'm standing on that box, and those two start going at it. The vice president's staying in his podium, but Steyer starts moving over, and he's gesturing, and you felt like you should back away, but I would have fallen off my box. So I'm standing there, and it's like coming close, and it's on live TV, and 15 million people are watching, and then I thought to myself, you know what, if he shoves me off this box, he's got really deep pockets, so like, I'm okay, I can handle this. So, but, when you think about some of the issues we're talking about, um, a lot of them are what people are thinking about. Like, they know, especially in this state of Tennessee, they get that the economy, that people have jobs, okay, but what is the problem? The problem is that people don't have shared prosperity. The problem is that it's really hard for people to afford things, even if they have a job. And the problem is that this president literally has not responded to those kinds of things, because they're complicated. You gotta work with Congress, you gotta figure out how you can bring the cost of premiums down, and you have to pass major legislation to be able to do that. So let's tick through some things. One, less expensive health care. So that has been a big subject of debate, and I look at it practically, which I know you do in Tennessee because of this Medicaid expansion, and I know what your former governor was trying to do and how hard it was with the legislature. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So there's a number of people, two of them, my friend Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, that actually are on this bill, Medicare for All. So let me explain, because I know it sounds good. But on page eight of the bill, it says that it will kick people off of their current health insurance, 149 million Americans, in four years. It also cost an extraordinary amount of money, leading one to believe it is more of a pipe dream than a plan. But there is something we can do that, to me, is much better, and that is a nonprofit public option, something Barack Obama wanted to do from the beginning to compete to compete with the insurance companies and bring down the cost of health care. So I look at this practically. I do not want to blow up the Affordable Care Act. That's what Donald Trump is trying to do in a lawsuit in Texas. I don't want to blow it up. And I look at it practically because I look at the fact that the guy in the White House right now, the Affordable Care Act is nearly 10 points more popular than he is. Okay, nearly 10 points more popular. So why would we tear it up? What we should do is build on it, and this gets some of the concerns in Tennessee. We should build on it. We build on it, one, by taking on pharmaceutical companies to bring down the cost of drugs. I have led the bill to unleash the power of 45 million seniors so they can get better prices under Medicare. Pharma literally got it written into law. Medicaid can negotiate, VA can negotiate, but Medicare is uh, literally banned from negotiating better prices. Uh, they had two lobbyists for every member of Congress, they still do, and that's how they got that passed. I have the bill that would erase those words from the law books. I have over 30 sponsors, and as president, I can get it done. Uh, bringing in 
less expensive drugs from other countries. In my state, you can see Canada from our porch, and we see those less expensive drugs, and that is why I long led the bill with Senator McCain, who I miss very much, uh, now Senator Grassley. Uh, Bernie and I actually did an amendment on this once at midnight, and we got 14 Republican votes. Maybe they were tired, I don't know, but we got those votes. And so the point is, I have found out a president can literally do this herself. I found 137 things that a president can do herself in the first 100 days without Congress that are legal, all right? Legal, legal. And one of them is to bring in the less expensive drugs to create leverage to bring down the prices on common drugs like insulin. Um, another thing that we should be doing, of course, is, and I know this is such a problem in your state, in especially the eastern part of your state, this is getting at addiction and mental health. Um, we have never had a president that's come in with a major focus on addiction and mental health. There's people that have done good things while they're in office, but this is one of my major priorities. Why? Because I see how many people it affects. One out of two Americans, someone in their family struggles with addiction or someone that they know. One out of five themselves struggle with mental illness sometime in their lives. We have had a 30% increase in suicides in 15 years in America with students and LGBTQ community and farmers, people feeling isolated, veterans, people in rural areas. So the answer is there's gonna be a huge opioid settlement coming in, you know that, is to have a president that makes sure that that money goes out for treatment, for addiction, but also includes mental health. So that we can get more beds, particularly uh, in areas that are underserved, so we can get more counselors in our schools um, and make a difference. Yeah, for me, uh, this is personal. Uh, my dad struggled with alcoholism his whole life. Uh, by the time uh, my husband and I got married, he had his third DWI, and then the judge looked at him and he said, you know, you gotta choose treatment or prison. And my dad chose treatment. And in his words, he was pursued by grace because of his faith, because of the treatment, because of his family and his friends. He is now 91 years old, living in assisted living and sober. Uh, his, uh, his AA group still visits him there. And in his words, it's hard to get a drink around here anyway. <laughs> Um, Long-term care, another big challenge for our country, and instead of relitigating the Affordable Care Act, we should be working on long-term care. And it's not just an issue for seniors, it's an issue for anyone, people my age, who have kids and then also have parents that they want to make sure can retire in dignity and get the help that they need. So of course this means strong Social Security, so important in this state, strong Medicaid, but it also means thinking outside of the box. How do we make it easier for people to get long-term care insurance if they want to? Well, you help them by bringing down the cost of premiums, and I have a way to pay for this. Um, I, I like to pay for everything because honestly, Donald Trump has been treating all of you like poker chips in one of his bankrupt casinos and been greatly adding to the deficit um, when in fact there are some really smart ways we can pay for things and also start um, start going down with that deficit by start paying it down. Okay, so uh, the other thing we need to do is have more housing, which I know is a big issue in Knoxville, more affordable housing um, for really everyone, and I have an expansive plan to do that. But we also want to make sure we have senior housing because that will free up stock that other people can buy in their houses or get um, condos and the like. And so senior housing and allowing people to live closer to town would also make a big, big difference. So those are practical things. And I know they don't fit on a bumper sticker. But they are things that people would actually like their president to work on. Um, secondly... 
workforce training and education. So again, some of my opponents, and we gotta make a big choice here uh, coming up on Super Tuesday. Some of my opponents have this plan for free college for all. Um, that really sounds good on a bumper sticker, right? Um, and I was noting that Senator Sanders plans, when you combine all of them, they are $60 trillion. Just to make very clear, so if you think this will ever get done, that is three times, three times the cost of the US economy, not the federal budget, your whole economy, everything you guys do, <laughs> that's how much it is. So that's why I wanna get a plan that we can actually pay for and get done with a deadline. So here is my reason, here's my idea. My ideas are this, first of all, first of all, you make it easier for people to refinance their loans. If millionaires can refinance their yachts, students should be able to refinance their loans at a much lesser rate. Secondly, there's this 10-year repayment program that teachers here are in, I think, and a lot of people in public service. It's not working very well. I think we've got to fix it, and I think we've got to expand it to include in-demand occupations. And uh, the first thing we can do in my 100 days, by the way, in the first 100 seconds to make this work, we can fire Betsy DeVos. comes to education, I would say this, first of all, college, college, double the Pell Grants that would help people who need it most in Tennessee to afford it, go from 6,000 to 12,000 a year, double the income level from 50,000 to 100,000 a year, so more people, these are not loans, these are actual money to help people afford college, have it targeted on the people that need it the most, and that's a lot of people, and I would pay for this, about 500 billion, by taking the capital gains rate and putting it closer to the personal rate. Uh, one and two year degrees, uh, they, I know the work was done uh, to make those free in uh, Tennessee, but even more can be done on that front on the federal level, which would help your state. Um, investment in K through 12 and preschool in a big, big way. And what I always like to point out to people, when you step back and think really big, you look at our economy, we're gonna have over a million openings for home health care workers in this economy. So if we're gonna use hard-earned taxpayer money, I would not use it to send wealthy kids to go to college. Instead, I would use it, I would use it to help with child care, universal child care, and doing something um, about retirement and the like because we want to make sure people will take those jobs to help the people that are retiring or people that need help care in their homes. And we have no idea how we're going to fill this, so that's why we need to raise the minimum wage. We need to make sure that people are able to make a living from taking the jobs that we know we need to fill. Uh, secondly, secondly, we're going to have over 100,000 openings for nursing assistants. Those are one and two year degrees. Uh, we are going to have over 70,000 openings openings for electricians, and those are well-paying, good jobs, but we don't know how we're going to fill them unless we start having incentives for people to fill them. And we are not going to have a shortage of sports marketing degrees. I know this is a good sports town, okay, I know that. But we are not going to have a shortage of sports marketing degrees. We are going to have a shortage of plumbers. And so the whole thing is to step back and look at what our economy needs and then put those incentives in place so kids can get affordable education to fill those jobs. Other things that we've got. The rural-urban divide. I have spent my time in the Senate bridge. of her uncle and it was part of my life growing up and so ever since I've gotten to the Senate I'm on the Agriculture Committee uh, I have worked really really hard on the issues uh, like rural education and rural health care understanding that one size doesn't fit all and that is a really important issue uh, in Tennessee as well um, so that's kind of a tour in addition to that climate change uh, which affects every state in the country and making sure that our solutions work for everyone. And by the way, they can. When we get this money in that we're gonna get in, when you put a price 
on carbon, when you do that, you've got to make sure that that money goes to the people that need it the most. That that money goes for, and it's going to be a lot of money, that it goes to people, and it has to be airtight or we're never going to be able to pass it. That that money goes to people uh, who are working um, in certain jobs where we're going to see a transition. Uh, that that money goes to heating and cooling bills directly as dividends to people. Um, because we just can't keep going the way we are. Um, we have to get back in the International Climate Change Agreement. The only... When Donald Trump took us out of the agreement, the only two countries not in it were Nicaragua and Syria. They are now in it. So we are the ones that are not in it. And then um, it also is going to make, and when I talk about the money going back, I mean it. My grandpa, uh, as noted, was an iron ore miner. And at one point, when the mines would open and close and then other businesses would leave, they actually, someone took out a billboard outside of Duluth, and I remember this growing up, and it said, last one to leave, turn off the lights. We can't let that happen. So there are ways to do this. And I just want you to know, I look at this not just from my head, but from my heart. Um, and I am not going to leave Tennessee or areas of your state. Some will see benefit, some won't. You've got to make sure that that money goes to where people need it. All right, the last thing. Uh, to do any of this, to do any of this, uh, we have to win. And we have to win big. And we have to remember, as we head into Super Tuesday, that what unites our country is bigger than what divides us. And we have to bring people with us. So um, I thought about this a lot during the impeachment hearing. Uh, result, not what I thought it should be. But as I sat there, bleary-eyed, late into the night, I would look at my colleague's hair, and I would be like, because all we talk about with founding fathers, he looks like a founding father. His hair looks like a founding father. But the other thing I thought about was what that whole thing was about, which was about Donald Trump putting his private interests, partisan interests, in front of the interests of our country. And then I thought about other presidents who didn't do that when confronted with major challenges. I thought about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who got us through one of the worst times in our country's history. And when he died, he was so beloved that they put his body on a train, and the train went from Georgia to Washington, D.C. And people would spontaneously stand up along the tracks to show their respect. And a reporter came across this one guy who had his hat in his hands, and he was sobbing, and a regular guy, and the reporter says to him, sir, do you mind me asking, did you know the president? And the guy says, oh, no, no. I didn't know the president, but he knew me. He knew me. That, that is empathy. That is being willing to put yourself in the shoes of others, even if your background is different than theirs. That is that simple idea uh, that you can see and understand how they're feeling, so then you can work to represent them. That's what's missing, among many things, from this White House. That is missing. So I can tell you this. If you are having trouble stretching your paycheck, or someone in your family is, to pay the rent or pay the mortgage, I know you, and I will fight for you. If you cannot figure out how to pay for the long-term care for your parents and child care or college for your kids, I know you and I will fight for you. If you are trying to figure out how do I fill that prescription for insulin because the prices have skyrocketed, or how do I fill the refrigerator for someone in my family or friend, I know you and I will fight for you. That is what this is about. That's what it comes down to. With all the fighting that's going on, that's what it comes down to. And I can tell you this, if we spend the next four months tearing our party apart, we are going to have to spend the next four years watching Donald Trump tear this country apart. So I just ask you uh, to talk to your friends. And you've got just a few days here before you vote. And I truly believe that we need someone that unites us and not divides us. That is what I have done in every single race I have ever run. I have won in.
I have won in the reddest of red congressional districts. Not once, every single time. I have won in the rural districts, the suburban districts. I've won run where the steel workers are up in northern Minnesota in a big, big way when other Democrats didn't win. I have done it um, in Michelle Bachman's district every single time. I have won that district. And I have done it by going not just where it's comfortable, but where it's uncomfortable. I mentioned my husband, the third of six kids. Uh, when they would go on family trips in their station wagon, they would all pile in. Then they go to a gas station, and then they would all pile back in that station wagon. And my husband was always the quiet one, the good boy. And the story is not once but twice they drove off because they didn't notice he was in, in the car and left him behind at the gas station. I will not leave Tennessee behind at the gas station. And I am looking so forward to debating Donald Trump because I'm going to be able to say to him, you know, the middle of the country, the middle of the country is not flyover country to me. I am going to be able to say to him, you know, your background, you got $413 million from your dad in the course of your lifetime. That was your family's trust. Me, my grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines in northern Minnesota. He wanted to be in the Navy, but he had to quit school even before middle school, and he went to become a teamster, and then he went and he worked in those mines. He had nine brothers and sisters. His parents were very sick. He was the oldest boy. He had to take care of them, the youngest. When the parents died, he was only eight years old, and they took her to an orphanage in Duluth, and then he vowed he would go get her, and he borrowed a car, and two years later, he brought her home. My grandma and grandpa had my dad and my Uncle Dick, and they grew up up there in that hard scrabble mining town. But because of unions, that mine became safer. Because of unions, it became safer. And it allowed my grandpa to save money in a coffee can in his basement. And I can tell you, you cannot fit $413 million in a coffee can in the basement to save money for my dad to go to a two-year community college. And from there, my dad went to the University of Minnesota. He graduated with a degree in journalism. He covered the world. He got to do all kinds of exciting things. He was an adventurer. But for years and years and years, he covered sports. And he specifically covered the Minnesota Vikings. And just to give you a sense of the grit that I bring to this and the resilience, my dad once wrote a book in the early 80s, which is sadly still relevant today. And it was called, Will the Minnesota Vikings Ever Win? the Super Bowl. <laughs> True story. My uh, mom grew up in Milwaukee and she wanted to, yes, the site of our next convention, and she wanted to be a teacher and she moved to Minnesota and she taught second grade until she was 70 years old. I still meet people that say that she was their favorite teacher. By the way, her favorite thing that she taught was a monarch butterfly unit, uh, where she would release this butterfly and in front of the whole group of kids, and then she would dress up as a butterfly in a tunic and tights uh, with antennas and a sign that said, to Mexico or bust, because that's where the butterflies would go. And it was not until she died that I found out why she would always go grocery shopping afterwards. I thought, she just thought that was funny in the outfit. When a family came up to me, the mom was sobbing. They were with their son who had severe disabilities. And the mom said, this is my son. He had your mom in second grade. And she was his favorite teacher. And he loved that butterfly unit. And she said years and years and years later, he graduated. And then he uh, gets a job bagging groceries at the super Super value nearby. And she said, your mom, every time, every year she taught that unit, had that outfit on, she would go to his store in the outfit. That's why she did it. She'd get her groceries, and she'd stand in his line and give him a big hug. That was my mom. That, that is public service. So I stand before you today as a granddaughter of an iron ore miner, as a daughter of a teacher and a newspaper man, 
as the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Minnesota and a candidate for President of the United States. No matter where you come from, and you know this in Knoxville, no matter who you know, no matter how much money you have, no matter the color of your skin, no matter where you worship, no matter who you love, that you can make it in the United States of America. I am asking you to help me in this quest. There are so many people that thought I wouldn't make it through that blizzard when I made that announcement. Then they said I wouldn't make it through August. Then they said I wouldn't make it to the debate stage. Every step of the way, like so many people in this town, we have defied expectations. And we have done it the right way, with regular people helping us online. Since the debate in New Hampshire, we got in literally over $13 million in one week from regular people online. Why? Because they wanted something different. Because they think the best way to beat the divider in chief is not to try to out-divide him. That they think that we don't necessarily need the loudest voice in the room. We need the person that's passed over 100 bills as a lead Democrat that knows how to get things done. And they believe that we need to bring decency back to the White House. So I am asking you, I am asking you to help me defy those odds, to go out and talk to everyone that you know, to get people to vote, and together we will win big. And I will be the president, not for all of America. Yes, all of America. I will be the president, not for half of America, but for all of America. And that includes Tennessee. Let's go out there and win. Thank you, everyone. Softer, irrelevant, 